Shall we pray? Our Father, we know your word tells us very clearly that our default is self-deception. We need your spirit to show us clearly who we are and what our relationship is before Christ. We pray especially today as we look at some difficult verses. May your Holy Spirit apply them as you would have us each respond to the word today. We humbly ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we're going through the Gospel of Luke, we've come to these challenges in Luke 9, beginning with verse 43, and we've read those earlier in the service. But Jesus will often return to these, these themes, and so let's look uh, and read now as we some, some verses to come where Christ repeats these same themes. Turn with me to Luke 12 and verse 51. Luke 12, 51. This is God's word. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? <clears throat> no, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father and against son, and the son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Just a chapter over in chapter 14, 25, Christ again re returns to these things. Luke 14, 25, now great crowds accompanied him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Turn back to Luke 9. In the verses we look at, look at verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. From this point on in the Gospel of Luke, this is really a hinge. Now the focus is on Christ going to the cross in Jerusalem where he will lay down his life for his people. And so from this point on, his, he sets his face, language of determination, as the Messiah of Isaiah 50, verse 7, who sets his face like flint. There's no turning back from this point on. George W. Bush addressed the Congress and the American people after 9-11, after the attacks on the United States in September of 2001, before the beginning of the war with Iraq and Afghanistan. And he said, we will not waver, we will not tire, we will not falter, we will not fail. That's setting your face. Jesus Christ, from this point on, there will very, be much fewer miracles in the Gospel of Luke. Now the attention is on teaching. He's preparing his disciples for the day to come. From this point on, Jesus begins a slow walk to Jerusalem, and he's going through all the towns and villages where he has yet to proclaim the kingdom of God. But he's headed to Jerusalem. He's set his face to go to the cross for our redemption. From this point on, he will not waver. He will not tire. He will not falter. He will not fail. But what a contrast in the rest of the chapter. And I, I wonder if that isn't the direct intention of the Holy Spirit to show by contrast. Here's the Lord Jesus determining he's going to the cross. He will not fail. But what a contrast to all of those who would claim to follow him. And we'll look at the, the, some of the responses. The disciples, proud ambition, verses 43 through 48. The Samaritans, uh, hostile rejection, 51 through 56. 
And then you have these three would-be followers with good intentions, verses 57 through 62. What a contrast. The first is the disciples' proud ambition. What a contrast to Christ setting his face to go to Jerusalem and the disciples They don't understand what's going on. They don't understand, first of all, that Christ's mission was death before glory. He's plainly told them he's going to his death. His death must precede glory. You see it in verses 43 through 45 of chapter 9. Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. This isn't the first time he's told them so plainly, just a week before. Back up in verse 22, he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. I'm heading to Jerusalem to give my life on the cross and be raised again for the salvation of my people. I must do this. This is divine necessity because this is God's plan from the beginning of time. It must happen this way because of all the prophecies of Scripture. It must happen this way because this is the only way that God's justice and God's mercy can be satisfied in the salvation of sinners. It's only through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the disciples do not understand. Christ's mission is death before glory. They also do not understand their calling. Their mission is also death before glory. You see it in verses 46 through 48. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. You see, they're wrongly assuming that Christ's kingdom now is going to be a glorious event. This is going to be grand. This is going to be political. This is going to be the overthrow of the Roman Empire. And we're involved, and they're arguing. And that's the sense, verse 46. They were having an argument. Who is going to be honored more than others? Who's going to be secretary of state? Who's going to be on Christ's cabinet? They don't get it. The calling for them was death before glory. This is not the time for glory. And they return to this argument again and again. The scripture records at least a couple other times in the upper room. Can you imagine? They're arguing who's the greatest. On the way to Gethsemane, the crucifixion of Christ, they're arguing who's the greatest, who's going to be having the seats in his cabinet. They do not get it. Their calling is death before glory. We don't get it either. Because that's Christ's challenge to all who would follow him. And he's told us plainly, verse 23, just the week before, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Every believer, it's death before glory. In this life, we're to put ourselves to death each day, which includes our sins, certainly, putting our sinful nature and desires to to death for Christ and by faith to follow him. But it's more than just putting sin to death. It's to crucify even legitimate desires and legitimate rights in order to follow Christ. His mission was death before glory. He says to his disciples, he says to you and to me, your mission is death before glory. And to illustrate that, he takes this child and puts him front and center next to him. It was a powerful example in that day because in that day, the Jews were taught that a child younger than the age of 12 could not be taught the Torah. To spend time with them was considered a waste of time. What a contrast to that day where Jesus takes a child and he, to get down to their level, to explain to them, to serve them. What a mark of humility. What a mark. You're not in this for yourself. You're, in the, you're, in, you're following Christ in order to serve. And this child in that culture especially represents everybody who's not going to give you an advantage. You're not going to get anything from them in return. This, isn't, this relationship with a child is not going to benefit you. You're not going to get ahead. You're not going to have any influence. It takes humility to make friends with such a person, to get down on their level, to serve them who can give you nothing. But that's the standard of Christ's kingdom. The standard of Christ's kingdom is not who's going to serve you and benefit you. The standard of Christ's kingdom is who can you serve, who can you give to, who can give nothing in return. Christ calls us to, to, 
to serve others with no recognition for ourselves. As Mark summarized it in Mark 10, 45, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus served others first. He spoke to those to whom no one spoke. He dined with the lowest members of society. He touched the untouchables. He had no throne, no crown, no bevy of servants or armed guards. A borrowed manger and a borrowed tomb framed his earthly life, Charles Colson. Christ has plainly told his disciples, for me and for you and for all who follow me, in this age, it's death before glory. And they don't get it. They're arguing who's to be greatest in the kingdom. There's another group of people who just don't get it, and that's the Samaritans' hostile rejection, verses 51 through 56. The Samaritans have a long history of hatred toward the Jews. You can think of the parable of the Good Samaritan and other places. The last thing a Samaritan would do is make it convenient for somebody traveling from northern Galilee to come through their territory to go down to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. They're just one example of all who have rejected Christ. He came even unto his own, and his own received him not, John 1. So they've rejected Christ, who's come, wanted to come through Samaria. And look at the disciples' ignorant zeal, verses 52 and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. See, they still have the same perspective. They're assuming Christ's kingdom is to be grand and glorious, and who would oppose Christ in all of his greatness? How dare these Samaritans reject the Lord of glory? James and John are known as the sons of thunder, and they want to do like Elijah did, call down fire from heaven. And Jesus rebukes them. Why? He doesn't rebuke them for the concept of God's wrath and God's judgment. That day will come, but at the second coming of Christ, this is not the time for God's wrath to be revealed against those who reject Christ. This is the time of God's long-suffering and patience, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to Christ in the gospel. And so Christ is rebuking them, not for the concept of God's wrath or judgment, but for their timing. This isn't the time. And it's a good thing Christ showed compassion on the Samaritans that day because all of these disciples would be just like the Samaritans in the days to come. They would all reject Christ. They would all crucify the Lord of glory. And how grateful they will be on that day when Christ's patience and forgiveness is expressed to them for even crucifying the Lord of glory. And in the days to come, we read that Peter and John took the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans, Acts 8.25, but not yet, not at this point. They just don't get it. Christ's mission is to set his face to go to Jerusalem to accomplish our salvation, but the disciples don't get it. They're arguing who's the greatest. The Samaritans don't get it. They're rejecting the Savior of the world. And then the chapter closes with these three would-be followers, and maybe your hope is up. Oh, here's finally somebody who understands what it means to follow Christ, verses 57 through 62. These three prospective followers of Jesus Christ. And his response to them is interesting. Does it seem harsh? Does it seem strict? Does it seem confusing? Why would he respond this way to three that would-be followers of him? You'll notice that Luke gives no names. He gives no context. He also gives no results. We don't know how these three eventually did respond to Christ, whether they did or not. The fact that it's left general is to focus the question even more clearly to us who are now reading the Gospel of Luke. And you hold up the Gospel of Luke here as a mirror and you, you see these three and all you know is the issues that they were dealing with. And so it focuses very clearly on our own hearts. You would follow Christ, will you? Are you one of these three? And so we have to wrestle with these questions as well. 
Jesus never kept the cost of discipleship from those who would want to follow him. He never embraced nominal Christians. He was very clear that if you're to follow me, then there will be a cost. He told them up front, never promised them an easy life. As Riken put it, his message was, I love you and I have a difficult plan for your life. The gospel is free. Oh, it's wonderfully free because Christ has done it all so that all who come to him, knowing that he, on the cross he took our sins upon him, he paid the full wrath and judgment of God so that all who trust in him are fully, fully, freely forgiven. And God counts the righteousness of Christ to our account so that we're accepted before God in the righteousness of Christ. It's all a free gift received by faith alone. That's wonderful good news, period. But the cost to follow Christ and to be a disciple is, is Christ demands everything. As Drummond put it years ago, the entrance fee is nothing, but the annual subscription is everything. Do you know that the phrase, accept Jesus as your personal savior is not found in the Bible? Even the expression, trust Christ as your personal savior, is not in the Bible. In the New Testament, how many times do you think Christ is referred to as the Savior? Would you have a guess? 16. How many times do you think Christ is, in the New Testament is referred to as the Lord, or the Lord Jesus, or the Lord Jesus Christ? 925. Jesus, to be your Savior, is to be your Lord. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And this is required for every believer. If you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, he must be your Lord. To follow him, he's calling for total surrender of our lives to him. So that's the context as you come to these three would-be followers. The first would-be follower is quite enthusiastic. I'll be your follower. And what does Christ say to him? Look at verses 57 and 58. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. It was the custom in that day for a, a rabbi to have disciples that he was to train and teach. They would actually live together and in the context of just everyday life, they would be asking questions and counter questions and that was the form of their education. This man coming to Christ and he's coming to Christ and he's saying, I wanna be your disciple, I wanna follow you, rabbi. Will you take me on as your protege and will you teach me and instruct me? And Matthew in the parallel account tells us that this man was a scribe. Talk about influence, talk about power and position. Oh, wouldn't this be a benefit to have this kind of a man to be a disciple of Christ? But Christ says that all who follow him need to know what discipleship means. Will you count the cost? As Christ laid aside his rights in order to accomplish our salvation, Philippians 2, 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He came into this dark world that rejected him, and he lived in poverty. He had nowhere to go home, nowhere to lay his head. He gave up all of his rights to be our Lord and Savior. And so he's saying to all those who would follow Christ, will you accept the gift of salvation? Wonderful. And trust in Christ as your Savior, and now he's your Lord. And you need to deal with this question, are you willing to lay aside all of your rights in order to follow him? It's not recorded what this man did. Christ doesn't refuse him, Christ doesn't reject him, he just gives him the challenge. If you will follow me, you need to count the cost. Just as 
when Saul was converted on the road, on the Damascus road, no sooner than he was converted than Acts 9.16, the Lord said, I, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. God didn't conceal that from Paul, nor from you. To follow Christ, it's going to be a great cost to your whole life. Are you willing to lay aside your life to follow Christ? And it's not as if we can look ahead down the road and know all of the challenges to come, all the difficulties, all of the trials yet to come. We don't. But we know that he's leading us. We know that when that time comes, he will give us grace that's sufficient. Are you willing to give him your life and count the cost to follow him? Betty Stamm wrote in her Bible, Lord, I give you all my own plans, purposes, and desires and hopes, and accept your purpose for my life at any cost, now and forever. There's no way that she would know that her husband in the future was to become a missionary martyr. This is not a call to live this way in your own strength, but upon Christ's grace. Are you willing? You put your hand to the plow and your life will never be the same. Count the cost. You see, when we come to follow Christ, we're not in the place where we set the terms of negotiation. We don't tell Christ what the terms will be if we follow him. We don't say, well, I, I, I don't want to deal with these sins in my life. I, I, want what, I want to negotiate the cost of discipleship or the level of commitment. We have to be willing to lay aside all of our ambitions, all of our comforts, what we enjoy, what we think we deserve, what we want, all of our plans, all of our purposes, all of our desires, all of our hopes. Let all young followers be warned to young disciples, minimize not the cost. Let them not mistake feelings for faith. They face building that is costly, battling that is bitter. Allow them no misgivings. There is a battle to be fought, a work to be done, a war to be won, a race to be run. Let them weigh the matter well and be prepared to finish, if indeed they finish, with blistering hands and a bleeding heart. J.C. Ryle once said, nothing causes so much backsliding among us as enlisting disciples without letting them know what they take in hand. You must count the cost. Are you willing to lay aside your rights should Christ call them from you? There's this would-be follower. Great enthusiasm, but Christ challenges him. Will you count the cost? There's a second would-be follower in verses 59 and 60, and Christ's challenge to him is, will you lay aside your closest relationships and commitments to follow me? Luke 9, 59. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. This man has not volunteered to follow Christ as the first man had. Christ is now calling him, but he's pushing back. He's not willing to follow Christ right now. If the first man was too much enthusiasm, this man's the procrastinator. To understand the verses I think the best way to understand them is when he said, let me go bury my father. You have to understand that this man's father had not yet died. And you don't know when he would die. He could have been in perfectly good health. In that day, when someone died, the custom was they had to be buried the same day, certainly within 24 hours. And when a family member died, all of the rest of the family would gather in the home and sit in the home quarantined. You would be unclean for a week. You would not be out in public. You certainly wouldn't be out on a public road like Jesus met this man. You'd be quarantined with the family in mourning, preparing for death. So when this man says, let me go and bury my father, he's saying, let me go home until he dies. I want to put this question off about the Lordship of Jesus Christ and following Christ. Not yet. Let 
Notice in verse 39, first let me do this, showing where his priorities were. Now what the man was asking was not sinful in the sense of honoring your father and mother, the fifth commandment, caring for them in their old age. It's not sinful. But Christ knows his heart. He's using this to to delay following Christ where Christ has commanded and called him to follow him. So Christ says, let the dead bury the dead. I think this, let the dead spiritually, the unbelievers and the rest of your family can care for the family and for your father while he's in his elderly years. You need to leave your family and follow me. Christ is challenging him. If you want to be my follower, are you willing to lay aside your closest relationships and commitments and follow me. And that's that principle that sometimes even good things can get in the way of what God really wants us to do. Whenever Christ's claims come into our life and there's a conflict between Christ and family or Christ and friends or Christ and good things, who wins? Christ is to win. There can be no rival claims on Christ. Jesus often returns to this claim for his absolute allegiance. Luke 14, 27, Jesus says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. It's required to follow Christ as Lord and Savior, and then he applies it. Verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And yes, the word is hate. And Christ is using this to shock his hearers. He's saying, I am claiming absolute supremacy over all relationships. It's not a literal hate, because that would be in conflict with the fifth commandment to honor your father and mothers. But by contrast, Christ is saying, your love for me must far surpass all other relationships. As in Matthew 10, 37, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Devotion to Christ is wholehearted and great and first so that by comparison to all other relationships, there is no choice. It's Christ. So if there's a choice between the family wants to have a, a, a picnic, what's wrong with a picnic? On a Sunday, so you're not able to get to worship. And the choice is picnic or worship. Family or Christ. Who wins? It has to be Christ and his worship. He is first above all relationships. If you don't hate even those closest to you by comparison, you cannot be my disciple. And so Jesus says in Luke 12, 51, do you think that I have come to bring peace on the earth? No, I have not tell you, I rather division. For from now on in one house, there will be five divided, three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, because he's calling. Allegiance is not to the family, first of all. It's to Christ above all relationships. J.C. Ryle, we must be willing to offend family rather than offend Christ. No man can be a true disciple of Christ to whom Christ is not dearer than what is dearer to him in the world, Thomas Boston. To follow Jesus Christ, Jesus says to this man, he's saying to you, to me, to follow Christ means that Christ has to be first in your life above all relationships, above all commitments, above all things that are even good in themselves. Is he first? James Boyce says, it's true that Jesus may never ask us to break with our families for his sake or sell all that we have and give to the poor in order to follow him. Indeed, in the great majority of cases, this is not required at all, but we must be willing to obey in these areas or any other areas if Jesus asks it, and we must actually do it if he does. See this man here, let me go home and 
let me put this off. Let me put this question of the Lordship off. He wants to delay. He wants to procrastinate. And Jesus says, no, you're going to get sidetracked. I have to be first above all relationships. Will you, will you follow Christ? Will you seek first his kingdom above all things and not delay? You can't say, well, <clears throat> I'm so young still. I'm in college. Let me put this question off about seeking first the kingdom of God until... You know, I get out of college and get some direction to my life. No, you must seek first the kingdom of God now. Somebody who says, well, I, I'm so uncertain about life. You know, I've just graduated from college. I need to get my direction set and wait, wait till I'm married. Wait till I'm settled down. No, now is the time to seek first the kingdom of God. Years go by and somebody might say, well, boy, this is a busy time of life. We've got young children. I've got so many demands. I, wait till after I raise my family. Wait till after I see my place of security in my career and business. And, you know, my job is taking up all of my energy. No, now you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Wait till I retire, then I'll have plenty of time. Now, will you follow Christ today and seek first the kingdom of God? Don't put off even what is legitimate in place of Christ. Now is the only time you may have. Christ is requiring these three would-be followers. The first man is quite enthusiastic and quite fast, and Christ slows him down and says, wait a minute, you need to consider... Are you willing to lay aside your rights? Second man was too slow. He was procrastinating and Christ challenged him. You need to be willing to lay aside all relationships and all commitments in order to follow me. There's a third man and he has a divided heart and Christ challenged to him in verses 61 to 62. Another one said, I will follow you Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. When Elijah called Elisha to follow him and to become God's prophet to the next generation, Elisha first asked if he could go home and say farewell, and he did. First Kings 19, he went home, he burned his plow, he slaughtered the oxen, he had a feast for the town. He literally burned his bridges because there was no way he was going to return to his old life and attachments. He was done with farming forever. There was a definitive farewell, and he put his hand to the plow, that expression, and he did not look back. It seems that Jesus knows this man. If he goes back home, he's going to be sidetracked. If he goes back home, he's going to get pulled back into his family. He's going to get pulled back into the things that he loves. And he's going to have a divided heart. And Christ says to him, no, I want you to put your hand to the plow. Don't look back. There can be no divided heart. If you're to follow me, I am to be first place in your life over all things. And don't look back. Make a definitive decision to follow Christ. J.C. Ryle said it's impossible to serve Christ with a divided heart. If we're looking back to anything in this world, we are not fit to be his disciples. William Borden was the heir to the wealth of the Borden Dairy Corporation. So for his high school graduation, his parents gave him a very expensive trip abroad while he was abroad, seeing other cultures, he became burdened for those who were less fortunate. So upon his trip home, he enrolled at Yale, where he started a Bible study group, and he founded a mission to the poor on the streets of New Haven, sharing the gospel with the homeless, the destitute, and offering them the hope of the gospel. After graduating from Yale, he went to Princeton Seminary to prepare for gospel service, and after graduation, he set sail for China as a missionary. On, on his way to China, he developed spinal meningitis and died. When his Bible was discovered after his death, they found that he had written in the front corner of his front cover of his Bible, no reserve, no regret, 
no retreat, no reserve, no retreat, no regrets. He denied himself, took up his cross, followed Christ, and did not look back. Christ is saying, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. You will know the forgiveness of sins. All who come to me, I will never drive away. And I want you to know the cost up front. And if you come to me, you want to be my disciple. I'm calling from you everything. Will you follow Christ? Will he be your treasure? Will he be your joy? Will he be your security? Will he be your hope? Will he be your friend in times of loneliness? Will he be your father, your mother, your power to look straight ahead? Bonhoeffer put it this way, understanding Christ means taking Christ seriously. Understanding this claim means taking seriously his absolute claim on our commitment. The only man who has the right to say that he is justified by grace alone is the man who has left all to follow Christ. Such a man knows that the call to discipleship is a gift of grace and that the call is inseparable from grace. But those who try to use this grace as a dispensation from following Christ are simply deceiving themselves. It could be discouraging to read this chapter and to see the failures and the ignorance and the pride of Christ's disciples. They're, it seems like Christ is, is going this alone. Nobody seems to understand what's really going on. Here he has set his face to go to Jerusalem. and Disciples are arguing, others are rejecting. People haven't counted the cost whether to follow him. You get the sense that He's going to have to go it alone, and he will. And on the cross, he will be all alone, even rejected by the Father, because he takes upon himself our sin and is judged for our sin, and the Father forsakes him. Christ becomes our Savior all alone. You worship him for such love that he's given his life for you. And maybe you read this chapter and you see that the failures of the disciple and their ignorance and their pride and their bickering and their arguing and you say, boy, what's the future of the church look like? If these are the followers of Christ and these are the people that Christ is going to commit the church to, what's the hope of the church? But look around, it's the same with you and me. This is all that Christ has ever had to use to build his church, forgiven sinners who stumble and fall. But he's building his church with the likes of you and me. So don't ever think that you can't come to Christ because you're not good enough or you're not smart enough or you don't have it all together. Come to Christ. He's building his church with the likes of you and me, with the likes of these. Yes, count the cost but also the promise that Jesus said, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Again, J.C. Ryle, let us be willing to do anything and suffer anything and give up everything for Christ's sake. It may cost us as something for a few years, but great will be the reward in eternity. Shall we pray? Our almighty God and heavenly Father, thank you for the free gift of the gospel and the forgiveness of sins that Christ has paid in full for our redemption and receive it by faith alone. And that we are not our own, we've been bought with a price and therefore thank you that our Savior made that clear to us that he calls us to follow him with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind that he has full allegiance, he has first allegiance, he has total submission from our hearts. 
Father, if there's any areas of our life that you're calling us to deal with today, we pray that we will repent and turn from those idols and our own ambitions and follow Christ. We know that this call is not a call for our own strength. We cast ourselves upon Christ, for we know that without him we can do nothing, not even the commitment to follow him apart from his own strength to do it. And thank you, Father, that as we commit ourselves to follow Christ, you will take and use even the likes of us to build his kingdom. We pray that your word would bear fruit in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen.